Hey everyone, and welcome to another Modeling Seb video, and welcome to a new series where today I will be... Wait, what's this? Yeah guys, today there will be no build video for this T-34, however those do seem to be the videos that usually are the least interesting to watch. So instead, I'll be able to get right into the more interesting stuff like the heavy post shade that will be applied later to this model. Just some background on this kit. It's an older Dragon model from 2004, and as would be expected, it's quite a nice kit for Dragon. I built it well over a year and a half ago now, and I don't really remember there being any specific fit issues aside from the side stowage bins being a bit weird in some places, but I did only put one onto the kit. The model itself is lovely and comes with some photo etch and a metal barrel, and because it's a Dragon kit, they give you way too many parts. So even if you don't want to build this specifically as a captured version, all the parts to build a standard T-34 from 1941 are included aside from the decals. I got this kit at a model show about two years ago now, and for a fairly good price. If I remember correctly, it was only about £20, which was an absolute steal in my opinion. Similarly, I bought a set of tank T-34 crew figures for only £6. So this does mean that yes, in this series there will be an episode of me just painting a figure, which should be quite interesting. But ever since I built it, it's just been sitting on my shelf with me not really knowing what to do with it. But after looking through some photos, I think I found a perfect mold to make. Which from as the title and thumbnail would suggest to you already, it is a recaptured T-34. And no, that is not a mistake, it's a T-34 that was captured by the German army and then once again recaptured by the Soviets. Of course the T-34 needs no introduction since it is the most famous tank of the Second World War and possibly of all time, with more than 57,000 produced in the Second World War alone. Now because of this, I thought it would be quite easy to find some sort of inspiration for this recaptured T-34, however after looking for a very long time I could not find anything. The Germans did capture many of these T-34s, but it seems that finding one that would be recaptured seemed highly unlikely especially one that I could make considering for a tank to survive from 1941, to be captured by the Germans and then to yet again be recaptured and used in frontline service seems very unlikely. However, one of my friends was randomly looking through Wikipedia when he came across this photo of a recaptured 1941 T-34. Bingo. Now this specific T-34 was used during the Tallinn Offensive by the Soviet's second shock army in 1944. However, for some reason, this image was only ever uploaded onto the French version of the Wikipedia page, so coming across it was pure luck. Later, through reverse image searching, I was able to find two more photos of this vehicle in Tallinn during the offensive. So now these are going to be the photos I will be using as inspiration, as will become very clear later on. Now, with this whole history out of the way, it's time to actually start to get going with the model. To start, I used VMS 4K Metal Prep to prime all the photo etch and the included metal barrel. This is very important for me to do so that when I apply the primer it has a much better surface to grip onto. This is a very good primer that I've used for a long time and I've never had any issues with paint peeling off so I would highly recommend it. Now after making sure I sufficiently coat each metal part, I let them dry. Now I can begin priming using my favourite Mr. Surface of 1500 Black. I make sure to cover the whole model and every single crevice so that if I were to make a mistake later on, it would not be as visible. The black primer is able to work as an artificial shadow in this case. The use of black basing will also be very beneficial to the absolute absurd amount of post shading that will be put on later. The wheels are a good example of where you want to cover each spot because some of them will not be very easy to cover later on, due to the potential of accidentally overspraying. Some of you might be then asking yourselves what would happen if you miss a spot with the base coat and with the primer. And a shorthand answer here is just don't. You have to be extra careful and make sure everything is covered. When I prime my molds, I go over them at least three times, especially on corners, to make sure no grey plastic will be coming through. Now, since I use Freel model tracks, which are made of metal, I need to blacken them. I need to do this so that they would allow for painting and weathering to be applied later on. Blackening effectively corrodes the white metal working as a primer, but it also works as a first layer of weathering for the tracks. The VMS Black Track Pro instructs you to put these metal tracks directly into the liquid and then submerge them there for about 10 minutes. However, by doing this, the effect would be much different than what I will be doing. If you were to submerge them for the full 10 minutes, it will come out completely black, which is not what I want. What I'm aiming for is a worn look, not completely blackened. To do this, I use an old toothbrush and just apply the Black Track Pro with it. This actually creates a far nicer texture and visual effect than what would have happened if the tracks were fully blackened. This can also be used to map the future weathering. Now, because Black Track Pro is just a rusting agent, you have to wear gloves and some eye protection as it can very easily irritate your skin and the smell is quite nauseating. 
so I would highly recommend having your windows open having a fan on if that is possible. Finally, I can start to get on to painting. Now due to this vehicle being recaptured, I wanted to give it some sort of identifying mark that at one point it was German. And in my opinion, the best way I could do this was to give it a different colour Coppola. But it's not the only benefit the Coppola will bring, it will also help to break up the monotonous 4BO green. Since both my previous models were single colour camo vehicles, I thought this little pop of colour would be very benefiting. The Coppola will also let me get a feeling for the airbrush and for the post shading. So to start off, I use the best Tamiya colour for German Dark Yellow, XF88. I choose to spray this straight from the bottle, and like all other paints, I thin it about 60% paint to 40% thinner, so that it reaches a consistency of semi-skimmed milk. This is a very nice base tone, and is quite adaptable to be dark and lightened. I followed this with my first layer of highlights, which is just the base layer, and I added some deck tan to it. Now, deck tan is probably one of the best and most universal highlight colours for post shading. Off the top of my head, I can't really think of a camera colour that would not benefit from it, aside of course from white. Luckily white is a rare colour to use for camo aside from winter white washes and UN vehicles. Now this is sprayed in a cloudy pattern to ensure some randomness to the post shade because that's what made the technique stand out. It also allows for all the later colours to blend in much better. Following this I applied a shadow layer which is a base layer with some flat earth added to it. I chose flat earth because it is not exactly a brown and it is very desaturated just like the base layer of the dark yellow. This is applied to the darkest crevice such as around the hat. I also spray the shadow from the bottom at an angle, same as you would if you were pre-shading a figure. This is purely done to get as much contrast out of the small cupola as is possible. Following the shadows, I do add some pure buff, which allows me to correct any overspray from the shadow layer. But this also works as a final highlight detail. Following this base colour for the cupola, I add on some green. I decided the Coppola should have a cursed camo to indicate when it was captured. For this dark green, I used pure XF89. The whole Tamiya line of XF88 to 90 is great for German tanks and camos. This line was specifically made to imitate these sort of camos, and in my opinion, this is a must-have for any modeler. I use XF90 for the brown, and these small lines do have some overspray, but there is really nothing I could do. Now, this would actually be a good time for me to ask you to subscribe if you are enjoying this video so far and would be interested in seeing updates for this model. If you want to get some sneak peeks at progress for not just this model, but also all my other models I'm currently working on, I recommend you go visit my Instagram page and a link to the Discord server in which I am highly active in. So, if you want to talk to me and a great bunch of modelers, the links are down in the description. Now I can get onto the really interesting stuff, the heavy post shade. To start off with I mix a base layer which is not too dark because I want to give a go at spraying shadows on later as well. So I decide to add some yellow green to the mix. This is going to be the same mix as I did on the T30S but bumped up to a whole new level. Since that one was kept intentionally dark so that it would not contrast too much with a whitewash of the winter camo. This will hopefully lead to a nicer overall look for the model and make it more distinctive when compared. I don't want the black base to go to waste, so instead of spraying the base as a flat coat, I instead already begin to use thin mottled patterns. This makes the underlying colour come through a bit more, and will at the end pay off very well. Mottling paints one over another means that they get to blend in much more and have a slightly worn look to them already. Some sort of discoloration or basic wear. This is especially important for a vehicle like this, which would have been serving on the front lines for several years now, with a minimal change of colour to it. I continue to spray the model pattern all over the model, and the results are actually quite nice. The camera does have some trouble picking up the detail, but you can clearly see some of the black basin come through already. After using each coat, I pour it back into a mixing container and just continue to add paints there. Save on time, I did this all in one continuous process, so that the paints would not dry up. This means that the airbrush would not have to be deeply cleaned in between each individual layer. I did have a quickly blast any remaining paint and added some thinner to get the remnants off. This means that when I begin to paint with the highlight layers, it won't accidentally begin to spray the old colour. Now with the first highlight, I use the same cloudy pattern. However, here I do make sure to make it more centred. This means that progressively each paint layer will use less and less paint. This first highlight layer will work as the main map for all the next layers to come since the borders of where I am spraying will indicate to me later not to go past them. This is quite useful, especially when working with many layers and highlights. The first layer is not meant to be much different from the base coat, basically being a one-to-one -one mix of the previous base colour, which means that XF58 is no longer the dominating colour. The second highlight layer uses the previous mix lightened with some cockpit green. This is a very pale lime green sort of colour, this means it'll work very well when it comes to post shading, and again, this next layer is more focused as centre, not going past the boundary set by the first highlight layer. 
The model patterns are really starting to come out with this layer and create a very interesting post shade and make the model itself look quite amazing. This second highlight layer is however a bit too similar to the first one in my opinion and if I were to paint this model again I would definitely use way more XF71 but it's definitely possible for now. This is also the layer at which I realised how long this whole painting session was but it's close to the end now with the next thing in line being the shadows. I won't be lying and saying that I felt confident when I began to spray this shadow layer. This was the very first time I attempted this sort of thing and like a fool I did not use any spare parts to make sure I could even do this technique. But after a small mistake at the very start of the shadow layer, I think I genuinely got the hang of it. The key thing was to lower the air pressure slightly and who knew such a small change could actually work such wonders. The shadows were sprayed in all the places where you would think to put a pin wash later on. This includes the weld lines as well as any recessed areas. This means that the vents and crevices around the hatch on the back of the tank were a logical place to apply these shadows to. This technique is surprisingly easy and if you have steady hands it is a must try because it makes the details pop so much and I can't wait to see how it looks when the mold is fully weathered. Now the final highlight layer and the layer I used to correct any previous mistakes such as with the shadow layer being a bit too strong in some places, I simply take the second highlight mix and just add some deck tan to it. Like I said before, this is simply a fantastic and universal colour for post shading. I must have about 4 bottles of this stuff and I run out of it so fast it's actually annoying. Consider it like the salt and pepper of the scale modelling world. This is again sprayed in the same way as before, being mottled all around the tank. This now means that the whole post shade is now complete and I can get to the nerve wrecking part of peeling off the masking tape of the cupola. Now this Tamiya masking tape should not peel any of the paint off, however it is still a very stressful because the possibility is still there. Luckily it went off without any issues and I must say the contrast is quite nice. To make this T-34 truly be a recaptured one, I add the Soviet markings as seen in the photo. And whilst I could use stencils, it would have been annoying to make them, and I bought this AK weathering pencil specifically for this job. I was actually inspired to do this by Rick Lawless video on his ISU 152. Here he also used the white watercolour pencil for the exact same reason. It's really hard to make the markings on camera due to the camera being in the way, so the actual markings were done off screen, but you can see me struggling here with the first attempt. The best part about these watercolour pencils is that you can just rub off the paint if you make an accent like I did. But in the final shots you will see the real markings I achieved and I don't think it looks too bad. I'll be sure to go back to them and touch them up with some acrylics and oils. And now with this video coming to an end I can't forget about the figure, which just reminds me of how bad of a figure painter I really am. And it will probably not come out the best but no matter what I will film it and post it on here for your enjoyment if you do so wish to call it that. But as usual it's time for me to say goodbye and leave with these final photos. I surely do hope you enjoyed the video and if you did then please do leave a like and if you didn't then dislike. And please tell me how I can improve in the comments. Both in terms of video making but also in terms of model making itself. Since constructive criticism is always welcome. If you want to see the next video be sure to subscribe to be notified of when it's released. And also follow me on Instagram to take a look on all the models I am working on. And if you want to talk to me join the discord. Thank you all for watching this far and I hope it was worth the several month wait. However, with me already working on the next video, I will be able to release it within a logical time frame. Thanks again for watching and happy modeling everyone.